And welcome. So glad that you're here. And welcome to those at the East Campus. So glad that you are with us as well. I um, want to encourage you to, um, we're going to uh, bounce around the Bible a little bit um, in our message time, but uh, if you received a, um, an info guide when you came in that has message notes on it, this would be a great message to have notes in front of you. You'll understand as I uh, begin to wait, make, my way, um, make, make my way through it. And as uh, John just said, and I just want to say to those of you at East Campus as well, uh, U Games, you know, our next generation here, which we consider to be our children's ministry and our student ministry, our young adult ministry, is a high priority to us. And um, uh, U Games this week, a tremendous outpouring in terms of the Spirit of God moving in the lives of children. And uh, you just think, you know, we, it was just told here at uh, East Campus at Central that 52 children uh, made a commitment to asking Jesus Christ into their life this past week during U Games. And you think if, if, uh, if, if, in fact, the Holy Spirit takes hold of those children as they submit their lives to him, what they are going to enter into over the years to come and what they are going to spare themselves of as a result of, of asking Jesus in their lives. Uh, what a tremendous ministry. And East and Southwest will have U Games this week, so please be in prayer uh, for them. And then um, uh, I had made a brief video for our students to be shown, uh, I believe it was last weekend, uh, because I wanted to make a personal pitch to them with regard to camp. Uh, when I look back over my life, I look at a camp experience I had following my junior year of high school and a camp experience I had following my senior year of high school. And those have proven to be two of the most significant experiences I had as a student in, in high school. Um, and I still look back, I can tell you where I was, the sessions, messages that I listened to, decisions that I made for Jesus in those settings that still are bearing fruit in my life today. And so if you are a middle school or high school student, I can't say to you strongly enough, don't miss the opportunity to go to camp. And if you are a parent, a guardian, a grandparent, and you have a relationship or a neighbor who's a middle schooler or a high schooler, this is an opportunity you do not want uh, to miss. I just want to do all I can to encourage you uh, to avail the opportunity. Okay? Well, let's pray, and we're going to open God's Word um, to a message that uh, is um, foundational to my life, and I would like to see it foundational to your life. So let's pray. Father, we just uh, surrender ourselves to you now. Give us ears to hear uh, the truth that we're going to walk through in the message um, today is, is such significant truth, so foundational to life. And uh, so, Father, just speak to us now. Give us ears to hear for our good and your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I want to begin the message today by asking you what is perhaps the most often asked question in life today. In fact, it's a question that we ask of one another. In fact, you've probably had someone ask you the question today, and it's just so much ingrained in life that we just like ask it without even thinking, and we answer without even thinking. And the question is, how are you? How are you? Or another way, how are you doing? Now, I want you to take your answer off of autopilot, okay? So no fines allowed, no goods, no okays. How are you? How, how are you doing? Fine. Somebody, they just couldn't help themselves. They, they just had to answer fine. Um, I, I, I want to ask that. And I want you to answer it sincerely uh, through the course of this message. In fact, I want to take it one step further, and I want to help you answer that question. Not only in your own eyes, but I want you, more importantly even, to answer the question in God's eyes. Because if there's anyone who knows, really knows how you're doing and cares about how you're doing, guess who? It's God. He knows how you're doing, and he wants you to know how you're doing. And so I want to, in all sincerity, I want to help you answer that question from a, from a biblical perspective, and I want you to be able to walk out of the service today, and, and my hope would be that not only would you be able to answer the question honestly um, today 
tonight, but it would be presented to you in such a way that it would be memorable enough that you would then ask yourself to answer that question through the lenses of the Bible for the rest of your life, okay? So I want to begin in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, the context of where we are before we start reading any verses is this. There's a man named Saul. He is the current king over God's people, Israel. But Saul has failed to honor God, and he has failed to honor God repeatedly to a point where God has now said, I have rejected Saul as king over Israel. I'm going to replace him. And so what God does is he goes to one of his prophets whose name was Samuel, and he says, Samuel, I have rejected Saul as the king over Israel. I'm going to replace him, and so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to a man named Jesse, and I want to have you ask Jesse to bring his sons to meet before you and in turn before me, for among his sons I have selected the next king of Israel. All right, with that in mind as background, let's pick up 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6. When they arrived, meaning Jesse and his sons, Samuel saw Eliab, who was the oldest son, and thought to himself, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. And so he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. And so he sent and had him brought in. Now he was ruddy with a fine appearance and a handsome features. Then the Lord said, arise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went on to Ramah. So God conducts a draft, if you will. He goes through seven brothers, the only seven that Jesse even brought. In other words, if you read into the situation, you, you think to yourself, well, Jesse just considered David to not even be an option. So he doesn't even bring him. Samuel sees the oldest brother whose name was Eliab, and as upon looking at him, he says, Wow! This has got to be the guy. He, he looks like a million bucks. And what does God say? Very familiar, famous verse. Yeah, don't look at his outward appearance. That's not what I look at. I look at his heart. Well, eventually David is, is brought in, and the reason he was qualified was because of what? He possessed the heart that God was looking for. Did you know that the word heart appears nearly 850 times in the Old Testament alone? The heart in biblical definition, in Hebrew definition, it doesn't refer to what we think of as simply the place of emotion. No, the heart in, in biblical terms refers to the inner person. It includes our mind, our will, our soul, as well as the seat of our appetites and emotions, meaning when the Bible speaks of the heart, it's talking about who you and I really are, the inner person, who we really are. So let me rephrase my opening question of how are you, and let me ask it a biblical way, and the question would be, how's your heart? How's your heart? That's what God sees. God's looking at the heart. That's what God sees. How, how's your heart? Now, you may say, well, um, well, I don't know. 
I, I, I don't really know how my heart is in light of the fact that it's my mind, my will, my soul, as well as a seat of emotions and appetites. I don't know. Well, if you don't know, you're in a good place because the Bible's going to tell us how we can know. All right? And I want to very quickly walk you through six indicators. Now, there are many more indicators, but these are, I think, in the pages of the Bible, these are six primary indicators that tell you and me what the condition of our heart is. And you'll notice on your note sheet there, and the reason I said it was important to have it is because you'll see a scale of one to five. So I want you to rate yourself, rate your heart in relationship to these six indicators. Five being, I'm really healthy, I'm doing great, I'm fantastic right now, I'm in great shape. And a one is... And I need a heart surgeon. Like, I, I, I got major blockages going on. Okay, everybody with me? Everybody understand the scales? All right. Indicator number one, spiritual passion. Spiritual passion, your desire for God. Let me read you a couple verses. Second Chronicles 16, 9, one of my uh, another life verse. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose heart hearts are fully committed to him. Are you fully committed to him? Are you, are you all in? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your steps or make your paths straight. Let, let me put it to you this way. If someone shadowed you for a week, shadowed you for a week, and then we're asked the question, how passionate is so-and-so about God? Based on shadowing you for a week, what number would they give you? If five is, oh my goodness, my passion for God is loud and clear in my life. No, that's a five. Say, well, I'm passionate about a number of things, but I don't think anybody shadowing me would say it would be God. That would be a one. So where, where are you, a scale of one to five? Where's your passion for God? Indicator number two, your words. Your words. Listen to your words. Matthew 12, 34 and 35, Jesus himself said this, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings forth good things out of the good stored up in him. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you think back to the words that you've spoken over this past week, past couple weeks, a month, what do your words tell you about the condition of your heart? Uh, critical words, a criticizing tongue would tell you that you don't have a very gracious heart. You have a demanding heart. Angry words probably tell you that there's hurt in your heart. Words of gossip and slander probably reveal that you have an insecurity in your heart. A profane tongue would indicate an impure heart. Ephesians 4.29 tells us what our words should be. This would be a five, if you will. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So what do your words tell you about the condition of your heart? Scale of one to five. Okay, indicator number three, your attitude. Your attitude. Notice your attitude. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the apostle Paul um, writes a whole section on the children of Israel, those that left Egypt after 400 years of bondage, making their way on the exodus under Moses' leadership. And what he says of them in verses 5 and 6 is this. He says, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Remember, they, they didn't enter into the promised land. They were, we're going to look at that later. They, they, they died in the wilderness. Verse 6 says, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And then Paul mentions four specific ways in which they dishonored God. 
First of all, he mentions they were idolaters. They were worshipers of idols. They put things before God. Secondly, he mentioned they practiced sexual immorality. Third, they put God to the test. And then fourth, and I find this to be interesting on the list, it's found in verse 10. And I, I typically don't think of this sin as ranking right up there with idolatry and sexual immorality and putting God to a test. But God puts it on the list. Look what he says in verse 10. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. In other words, they were complainers. They were complainers. Friends, an attitude of complaint is an indication of a heart that is diseased. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says what our hearts should be. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So again, if someone were to shadow you for a week and listen to what comes, comes out of your mouth and the attitude that was expressed... If thanksgiving and joyful is a five and a grumbling, murmuring, complaining attitude is a one, where would you place yourself, one to five? Okay? Indicator number four, your thoughts. Your thoughts. Matthew 15, 19, Jesus said, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. For, for out of the heart come evil thoughts. Philippians 4, 8 tells us what a five on the scale looks like. Verse 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Are you thinking positive thoughts or do you have a lot of negative thoughts running through your mind? When your mind is free to wander, what do you think about? You know, for me, I, I find out what's really going on in my heart when I go running. You know, I like to run. I run, you know, five, try five, six days a week. I wear a heart rate monitor. And the heart rate monitor, it doesn't lie. And now times, you know, and I didn't run today, but if I ran today, it's hot out. Did you know it was hot out today? <laughs> my heart rate monitor gets a little get a little higher when it's hot out. But, friends, there are days when I'm running and all of a sudden my heart rate is kind of, you know, is beeping at me in effect. And I'll stop for a moment and I say, you know, why is it going so high? And the reason it's going so high is because my mind is troubled about something. And it's reflected in the way my heart is racing. So when your mind is free to wander, perhaps you're just driving in the car, or you're just you know, going for a walk or something, and your mind is free to wander, what do you think about? That tells you something about the condition of your heart. <coughs> Indicator number five, your treasure. Identify what you treasure. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, Jesus said that in the context of a discussion about possessions, about money. You know, Jesus gave um, nearly half of his parables were in some way related to money and possessions. You say, well, why was there so much? Because, you see, Jesus knew what all of us know, if we're really honest with ourselves, and that is God's greatest competitor for our affection is money the things of this world. So, on the treasure principle, if I can call it that, scale of one to five, what do you treasure? Second Corinthians 9, 7 said, each man, obviously each woman implied, should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, people think of giving as a money issue. It, friends, giving is not a money issue. M giving is a heart issue. Money is just a currency of our heart. Indicator number six, your spirit, your spirit. I think Paul speaks of the spirit well in Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. This is what he 
what he writes. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then look what he says in verse 15. It's kind of the capstone. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. So from a spirit standpoint, if you just take all those words there, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with each others, forgiving grievances, forgiving as the Lord forgave, letting the peace of Christ rule in your heart. One to five, how are you doing? All right, now, um, now that I've got all of you thoroughly depressed, um, <laughs> Hebrews 4.12 talks about the fact that the Word of God pierces like a two-edged sword. It does at times, doesn't it? You know, years ago, as I said to you, this has been a kind of a life message for me, this heart issue. And um, in an effort to remember those indicators, I realized when I wrote them out one time that they, if you just take the first letter, they, they spell P. Watts, W-A-T-T-S. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. Words, attitude, thoughts, treasure, spirit. So what, God, you're saying to me is my personal wattage in life is tied directly to the condition of my heart. So I just thought I'd pass that on to you so that you now can't forget the list either. We're called to be the light of the world, right? That's what Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Friends, we are the light of the world if our heart is healthy. Why is that true? Because when our heart is healthy, then our personal wattage will be high. When our heart is not healthy, then our personal wattage is low and we don't function as the light of the world. Now, you may say, okay, well, Don, how important is this? I mean, is this really a big deal? Well, friends, it is a, it's a really big deal. I'll read it for you again. I read it earlier, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Now, with regard to that, there's a great example and there's a really bad example. Let me just mention both. The really great example is David. David, as we read in 1 Samuel 16, was selected because of the condition of his heart to be the next king of Israel. There's a very powerful verse, and I don't know if you caught it, but let me go back and read it to you again because it's a very, very powerful verse. 1 Samuel 16, and I believe it's verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Now think of that in light of 2 Chronicles 16, 9. And I'm going to recite it the way I memorized it years ago. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. In the presence of his brothers and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. 1 Samuel 16. Do you know what happened in David's life in 1 Samuel 17? He took on a little guy named Goliath. Friends, what enabled David to take down Goliath? The answer is found in 1 Samuel 16, 13. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Is this a big deal? 
it's a big deal. That's a good example. All right, now let's turn to the book of Hebrews and let's look at the bad example. The bad example of the children of Israel. The children of Israel in the days of Moses provide an example that none of us want to follow. You remember they cried out to God for a couple hundred years that God would deliver them from bondage, enslavement in Egypt. God sends Moses to deliver her. God does incredible things to set them free. And he's going to now take them to a land that he's going to provide for them that they can call their own. But as we know, that first generation never got to that land. They grumbled, they complained, they rebelled. And finally God said, I've had enough of these people I've tried to teach them the ways of faith. They refuse to listen. They just grumble, 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 grumble. And as a result, I'm going to send them back to the desert to relearn the lessons of faith. And this first generation is going to die there. And then I'll start with the next generation. Well, in Hebrews chapter 3, we get the explanation of what was wrong with the children of Israel. In verse 19 of chapter 3, we read this. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. They had a faith problem. In spite of all that God had done to teach them the way of faith, they didn't get it. On account of their unbelief. You may remember that the final, you know, kind of nail in the coffin, if you will, in their coffin was when they sent the 12 spies in. And 10 came back and they said, oh, the cities there are fortified, large walls, the people are really big. We, we can't do it. it. It was only Joshua and Caleb among the 12 who came back and said, no, 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 God is with us. God, we can do this. Well, because the ten, the people listened to the voice of the ten. We read in verse 19, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And we know from a later chapter in Hebrews that without faith it's impossible to please God, right? So if you put those verses together, here's what it says. If you want to enter into all that God has for you, you're going to do so by faith. Friends, you and I are not going to enter into all that God has for us by sight. We're going to walk into what God has for us by faith. Well, obviously then the question is, well, how do I grow faith? How do I increase my faith? I want to have a greater faith. I want to enter into all that God has for me. I don't want to stop short of what God has for me. I certainly don't want to spend my life walking in the desert like they did. I want to enter into all that God has for me. How do I grow my faith? Well, when you read the verses preceding verse 19, you understand that their issue at its core wasn't a faith problem. They had a different problem. It was a deeper problem than faith, unbelief. So let's go back to verse 7. This actually quotes a psalm, Psalm 95 in the Old Testament. This is what the writer says. So as the Holy Spirit says, starting in verse 7, today if you hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me. For 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation and I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways and so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Friends, the reason they had an unbelief problem was because they had hard hearts. You see, what you understand is in God's economy, it always comes back to the heart. In God's economy, it always comes back to the heart. God is looking for hearts that are sold out to him. Those are the hearts, the lives that he's going to put his strong support behind. And so I ask the question again, how's your heart? It matters. If you want to enter into all that God has for you, if you want to walk in the ways of God, in the will of God, in the wisdom of God, if you want to be a light for Jesus in the world in which you live, if you want your words to be ones that build up other people, if you want to have an attitude of thanksgiving, 
if you want to treasure God above the things of this world, if you want to have thoughts that are pure and lovely and excellent and positive, if you want to be a person of spiritual passion, you want to be a person who is compassionate and humble and kind and forgiving, it all comes down to the heart. When you think about it, think about it this way. Faith is like a seed. If you and I walked out right now onto our front patio, or we walked out the front patio of East Campus, which in both cases is concrete, and you took your favorite plant seeds and you threw them out there, and then you blocked off the area and you set up a sprinkler system, although this time of year, probably don't need a sprinkler system, right? It's going to rain most days over the next couple of months. So we made sure that those seeds got plenty of rain over the coming several months. We don't have a problem with sunshine, right? Plenty of sun. And let's just say that, that we left and we were going to come back in three months to see the condition of those seeds. What would we find? We'd find a bunch of dead seeds, wouldn't we? Because we had bad seed or because of where we put it? You see, friends, God can't grow the seeds of faith in your heart or mine if the heart into which he's planting them is concrete. The children of Israel had concrete hearts. So then the million-dollar question becomes, well, Don, how do I cultivate a healthy heart? How do I cultivate a soft heart? How, how do I get my heart to look like where my wife, Mary Ann, is from, Iowa? Where when they put corn seed in the ground, you come back six months later, guess what? Six, eight feet high corn. Why? Because you can take a plastic spoon and go to the backyard of where she grew up and you can just dig and you just get black dirt. How do you get that kind of a heart? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in the time that remains, I want to give you God's prescription for heart health. Okay? God's prescription for heart health. And I think I have five specific ideas I want to give you. Okay? Number one, and it always starts here, repent of sin. Repent of sin. You know, when Jesus first showed up, he echoed the words of John the Baptist, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Friends, it always starts with confession and repentance of sin. Listen to what David writes in Psalm 32 about what was going on inside of him when sin was present. Here's what he writes. Let's pick up at verse 1. Blessed is he, David writes, whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man or the woman whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. However, when I kept silent, being implied, about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped as in the fever heat of summer." But then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now, when you take that apart, he says, when I was silent, he said, your hand was heavy upon me. In other words, he felt oppressed. That's what he's saying. I, I felt oppressed. Not only did I feel oppressed, but I felt depressed. My strength was sapped as in the fever heat of summer. Now, do we know anything about that? I flew into the airport earlier today, and I had been up in Michigan for a few days where it never got above like 72 degrees. I know, you're jealous. <laughs> and I walked out of the front doors of the Orlando airport, and that hot air hit me. What do you think happened to my energy? I don't think I feel like running this afternoon. <laughs> Friends, David says, when I was silent about my sin, I felt oppressed. I felt depressed. 
I felt that my energy was sapped from me like the fever heat of summer. Friends, you want a healthy heart? Make the repentance of sin a daily practice. Friends, I seldom does a morning go by when I don't take time that I have with the Lord that I don't in some way in the early parts of that stop and just say, Lord, what took place in my life yesterday that was not honoring to you in some way? And I start with repentance of sin. Now, if you don't repent of your sin, it doesn't mean that God loves you any less. It doesn't change anything in his love for you. It doesn't put, if you will, a, a major block between you and him. No, God still loves his people. Those who, you know, our sins are, 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 are covered because of what Jesus did. Our salvation is guaranteed by what Jesus did, not what we do. But friends, the quality of our life experience is affected by the cleansing of our heart, which is why David writes, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. When I was thinking about this just this afternoon, I turned to my, my Bible to Psalm 51. This is the psalm that he wrote on the heels of his sin with Bathsheba. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Skipping down, verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And then listen to what he says next. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Friends, heart health begins with repentance of sin. Make it a daily practice. James 5, 16. James writes, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Okay? Second, address your hurts. Address your hurts. Newsflash, life hurts. Is that new news to you? Life hurts? Life is unfair? People fail us, they disappoint us, they offend us, and our emotions get bruised. I haven't thought this completely through what I'm going to say next, but it's Saturday night, and you're the first ones hearing this message, so I can say this to you. <laughs> in being a pastor to people and relating to, to people, a lot of people over the years, and in many cases on deeper levels, I find that in many, many, many cases, it's not spiritual unhealthiness that is killing people. It's emotional unhealthiness that's killing people. And the reason people are emotionally healthy is because they're living with unresolved hurt. Friends, there are a few topics the Bible speaks more about than unresolved hurt and few topics that the Bible is more strongly um, opposed to or, or speaks to than unresolved hurt. Listen to Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. In other words, he says, you're going to get angry at times. You're going to get angry. Just because you get angry doesn't mean you've sinned. In your anger, do not sin. In other words, don't let it go to the point where that anger turns into a sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. I mean, don't end the day angry. Verse 27, this is the verse that's sobering. Do not give the devil a foothold. See, friends, the reality is this. When you and I live with unresolved hurt, unaddressed hurt, now what ends up happening is we, in effect, align ourselves with the enemy instead of aligning ourselves with God. Jesus got hurt, right? Jesus got hurt to the point of being hung on a cross. He got hurt. Life wasn't fair to Jesus. Here he is sinless, and yet he's dying for the sins of all of us. He was crushed for our iniquities, Isaiah writes. Life wasn't fair to Jesus. He was deeply offended. He was hurt. But he addressed it, resolved it to the degree that he was on the cross. And what did he say? Father, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. 
So he modeled for us forgiveness. But you see, when we don't align ourselves with Jesus in doing the exact same thing, we, in effect, align ourselves with the enemy, and we give him a place, as Paul writes, a place of standing, a foothold, a place to stand in our lives from which to wield influence. Pastor Robert Morris writes this about bitterness. Bitterness occurs when we feel life is unfair. We feel offended, pushed aside, annoyed, or provoked. We're resentful, cynical, grieved, jealous, or distressed. We have a chip on our shoulders. We, haven't, we feel we haven't received our fair share. We feel slighted, and it shows. If we're bitter people, then that bitterness produces other problems. Yes, it does, because the enemy's got a place of standing in which he wields influence. Bitterness comes to a head in a whole host of actions behaviors, and attitudes of the heart, including addictions, irritability, depression, pornography usage, lust, immorality, anger, lack of forgiveness, hate, envy, jealous, and more. Many problems can be traced back to this one root. Bitterness is a spiritual condition that Satan and his bunch can use to trap us in pain and despair. Our job is to prayerfully seek God's face and ask him to show us this root in our lives. We need to see the truth about this sin, confess it before the Lord, and then ask the Lord in Jesus' name to deliver us from any harmful spiritual oppression that has cropped up around it or because of it. Let me continue. Whenever we are bitter, we tend to become downcast or depressed. Bitterness implies that nothing can be done to remedy a situation. So all that is left for us is to stew in our sorrows. When we carry around bitterness within us, we carry around this sense of discouragement or rejection. This kind of oppression is often something we need to be delivered from in Jesus' name. And so he then asked this question. Is there resentment in your life? Is there unchecked anger, hurt, disappointment, or disillusionment? This bitterness will eat away at your life. You need to forgive. Perhaps there is a person, group of people, or institution you need to forgive. Perhaps you need to forgive yourself. Friends, you and I, heart health number one, repent of sin. Heart health number two, address your hurts. Address your hurts. You know, the great news about being a follower of Jesus Christ is that we can address our hurts. Do you understand that? We can address our hurts. All right, third, cast your cares. Cast your cares. Put another way, your worries, your anxieties. Proverbs 11, 12, 25 says, an anxious heart weighs a man down. We all know that, right? 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7 is, is, uh, is one that I practice often, almost on a daily basis. I find myself, I don't know about you, maybe you're like me, I'm, I'm relatively easily burdened. Are you easily burdened? Things weigh you down. You look at the day ahead and you sometimes just want to go back to bed. <laughs> An anxious heart weighs, weighs a man down, weighs a woman down. So what's the biblical remedy? Cast all your anxiety on him. So today, Lord, before I even start my day, at the very beginning of today, I just want to give you this and this and this and this. This meeting I have coming, this task I have coming, this, this child right now that I'm struggling to relate to, this financial issue we're facing, this bill that is coming in the mail, and I'm not sure we have enough to cover it. I just want to, I just want to give. You know, we, you know, I'm not a fisherman, but I understand enough about casting. When you cast, what are you doing? You're sending it away. Cast your cares. All right, number four. Here's a biggie. Reject lies and embrace truth. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 3 for a moment. I stopped at verse 11. So then the writer of Hebrews, after writing or talking about the children of Israel and their heart disease, then he says this to the current reader today in verses 12 and 13. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, and here's the key line, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. 
What that means is this. Every temptation that you and I face comes to us wrapped in a lie. Every temptation we face comes wrapped in a lie. Why do we give in to the temptation? Answer, because we accept the lie to be the truth. If we saw it as a lie, we wouldn't buy it. But we buy it because we accept it as the truth. So the writer here says, see to it and encourage one another daily as long as you is called today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We know the enemy is a liar. Friends, you and I need the discernment of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what lies am I listening to? What lies am I acting upon? You know, I hear a lot of people over the years say, you know, God's not going to meet my needs. And no, no, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he can meet your needs. After all, he says in Philippians 4, 19, and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus is not poor. So your bank account may not look very good. But the good news for you is your, your bank account isn't the only bank account you have. If you're, if you're related to Jesus, you're tied into his account. And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Now, if you believe the lie that your needs will not be met, God will not meet your needs, in order to believe that, what is the shape of your hand toward God? This or this? Pretty obvious, isn't it? But if your attitude is, and my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, now what is your hand doing? Friends, this and this are just a reflection of what? A heart. What's in the heart? Whenever you find yourself saying, I'll never, and then you fill in the blank, be careful, there's a lie coming. Or when you find yourself saying, I'll always, I'll always have this addiction. I'll never get over it. I'll never have victory over this sin. I'll always have a bad Anytime, never and always. Careful, there's a lie coming somewhere. I hear people say, well, God doesn't answer prayer, at least not my prayers. Well, God doesn't have a plan for my life. I remember years ago, I went through a little season in my own life where I was really questioning whether or not God had a plan. I had to memorize Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope, so that every time I heard that lie, I had to say, enemy, get out of my life. Don't speak to me, because the truth of God's word is this. So to identify the lies that you're listening to. In fact, let me give you a little hint here. If you're facing fears, there's a good chance there's a lie associated with it. If you're dealing with anxiety and worry that's beyond just, you know, minor kind of worries and anxieties, which we all have, there's probably a lie that's attached to it. If there's a temptation that you find yourself falling to over and over and over again, ask the question of the Lord, Lord, what is the lie behind this that I keep accepting as the truth? Fears, worries, and temptations have a direct tie in most cases to a lie. And then when you identify the lie, find a verse. Find a verse. The lie is the poison. God's word is the antidote. Find the verse. All right, fifth, and we'll end with this. Recall God's goodness and give thanks. Recall God's goodness and give thanks. The children of Israel were instructed by God to celebrate feast annually. We know about the Passover. We know about the Day of Atonement. Friends, the reason why God wanted them to do that, the reason why God wants us to celebrate communion on an, on an, not just once a year, but often, we do it you know, numerous times during the course of the year, is so that we never forget the goodness of God. You've heard me say before that I start almost every staff meeting when our staff meets on Tuesday mornings. I almost always start the meeting with what I just call God sightings. Why do I do that? 
because I want to drive a value into our staff people's lives, their heads, that you need to take stock of the goodness of God. You see, the goodness of God is what gives you a heart of gratitude. And you know, I find that the older I get, I was with my family for a few days this past week, and one night, you know, one of them said to me at dinner, you know, Dad, can you pray? And as I was standing there with my family, um, I had to just pause because I was, I was beginning to lose it because I was overwhelmed by the goodness of God. The older I get, the more overwhelmed I, I find myself with the goodness of God. I think one of the reasons for that is because for many years I have been devoted to recognizing the goodness of God. Are you devoted to recognizing the goodness of God? All right, let me wrap this up. Repenting of sin, addressing your hurts, casting your cares, rejecting lies and embracing truth, recalling God's goodness and giving thanks. Friends, make, make those five a regular part of your life. A regular part of your life. To close, Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23, Solomon. Uh, in the days of his great wisdom said this, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of of life above all else now do I need to define those three words when you read above all else are we all clear on what that means above all else what comes next guard your heart why it is the wellspring of life your words, your attitude, your thoughts, your practices, your habits, your relationships, how you handle everything in life will flow from the condition of your heart. So a very wise man named Solomon said, above all else, guard your heart. Friends, it's our job to steward the heart that God has given us. God gives us directives, repent of sin, address your hurts, cast your cares, reject lies, embrace truth, recall God's goodness. And God says, this is your prescription. You know, a lot of you take, you know, vitamins in the morning when you get started, right? I take some, you know, vitamins in the morning when I get started. Friends, here's a list. Here's five, here's five vitamins for your heart. Did you get that? Get up in the morning and take these five vitamins and start your day with a healthy heart. Let's bow our heads for prayer. I'll just give you a moment, and then we're going to just uh, sing the reprise of one of the songs we sang earlier. Just take a moment before the Lord, before we rush back out into life. Father, it's very encouraging for, for me, and I'm guessing most of us, that you're not obsessed with our physical appearance. If that was the basis of our value in front of you, many of us, I speak for myself, it wouldn't, wouldn't look too good. In fact, with every passing year, it seems to get worse. But Father, you tell us in your word that what you're really looking at is, is our heart who we really are on the inside. And for that, we can get better and better and better and better with every passing day. And we can because of what Jesus did on the cross and then rising from the dead, because we have the Holy Spirit, because of your word. Father, you've poured out to us all that we need to be healthy, relationally, spiritually, 
emotionally, mentally, in every realm of life, we can be healthy. No matter what's going on in our external world, we can be healthy because of you. We thank you for the great privilege it is to be a child of yours. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.